those things, if we're not careful, we think they occur by happenstance. That there are things either God does or He doesn't that either we feel like doing or we don't. Wednesday night, and it's rare that Wednesdays and Sundays cross over, we tend to stay in Wednesday night series around here and Sundays tend to stand on their own. Wednesday night we started a short series about working up a spiritual appetite. Working up a righteous spiritual appetite. Because if I'm not ever so careful, I forget that many of my appetites occur because of decisions that I make. There are things that that I love to do, but if I don't do them for a while... That you would not believe it to look at me today, but I used to run for an hour a day. I ran for an hour every day. That doesn't sound like much to you. If I ran for an hour, if I left here and ran for an hour, I, you'd find my body on the side of the road. Don't you marathon runner snicker at me? I'm going to talk to people over here. You know, <laughs> think I got the flu, got busy, had to preach a conference. I didn't run for three weeks, and I haven't run ever since. It's before I knew most of you, <laughs> because it's so easy. To fall in and out of habits. I used to wake up and want to run. I don't remember the last time that that happened. If you see me running, you better turn around and run too. Because whatever's behind me is bad. But I know other people who were in love with their Bible. And circumstances just sort of hit their life. And they didn't read it for a day. And then a week. And then a month. And. Now they probably can't remember the last time they read it if it wasn't off the screen while we took a text. And during this entire pandemic, I know sweet, godly people whose life revolved around the next church service who wouldn't miss anything. Love to be here, and they still love God, and they still love you. But my prayer and worry has been, I know what happens when you miss a few months of meals. Your appetite. And so today I'm not asking about our appetite. I'm asking us to be intentional. Don't think we've ever done this before, but we're going to teach lesson two of a few week series on a Sunday morning. If you happen to like it, you can find last Wednesday online. If you didn't like it, come back next week and we'll talk about something else. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we're not careful, we'll waste all of our time trying to get God to do things we think we want Him to do. But if you read the Bible, that's not how it works. If I get my appetite right, If I get it right on my end, I don't have to convince God to work righteously. I've just got to be hungry. I've just got to be thirsty. He takes care of the answers. So tonight, Brent Blake wanted me to call it the second helping. We're going to do lesson two this morning of working up an appetite. Let's ask him to help us. God, I love you. Lord, I thank you for loving me. Lord, we thank you for loving us. These sweet people here on a holiday Sunday morning right now, I pray that your spirit would just move through this entire building. Lord, for anyone next door, I pray, God, that your anointing would rest on our service, on our lips, on our hearts, on our minds, that God, as a group, we could take a giant step in your direction today. I want to leave here with my heart, with my mind, fixated on you I want to be more like you when I laid my head down tonight than I was when I rose up this morning thank you God for your goodness for your consistency for your grace in Jesus name amen 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 hallelujah you may be seated Wednesday night we kicked off the topic and If you'll allow me just a few seconds, I want to review a few simple points that we'll build on today. First, God promises to bless anyone who produces and manifests a righteous spiritual hunger. Who hungers and thirsts after 
righteousness. We don't have to worry about convincing him to do that. That's what he's going to do. Second, this hunger is an intense one. The word there literally means to crave ardently, to seek with eager desire. The Bible's full of phrases uh, about seeking God. He tells us that we're supposed to seek after Him earnestly, seek Him early. He he said that if we seek Him, we'll be found. And then third, uh, our spiritual appetite is a natural thing. We are spiritual beings, not just fleshly beings. And our spiritual appetite should be as natural as a physical hunger pain. Every culture ever found or discovered or even researched uh, 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 through archaeology has been found to channel worship towards something. And then the fourth thing we talk about, the challenge is to channel this innate spiritual hunger in a proper, righteous, godly direction. So we're talking about what can I do to work up a spiritual appetite, a righteous spiritual appetite and while the parallels to natural hunger may not be perfect there are are so many that are so obvious and some of the aspects which govern natural appetite certainly apply spiritually not just to me individually but to all of us collectively so we're going to talk about what does it take to produce for me to produce in myself a spiritual appetite A lot of it starts with a thyroid gland. For all of us who are not naturally skinny. For people like me. And we're going to drop that right there and move on quickly. There are individuals in this world that make us sick. There are folks that people like me have to pray about pretty regularly. You know the kind. Those select, fortunate, disgusting people who can eat whatever they want and they never gain a gram. I've got a friend that's, that's a strong word. I've got an acquaintance that we're nice to each other. And they're barely this big around. He eats three times as much as I do. We go out, we're at a conference, we eat pizza. He ate five pieces. I ate two. I couldn't get back in my jacket for service that night. He looks exactly like I did 20 years ago. It's wrong to hate him or I would. I need to pray about it. I knew a guy, I don't know that he weighed 150 pounds. And he literally commented out loud to another friend of mine that he was going to have to cut back because he gained six ounces over the last six months. They'll never find the body. We all know that person. I'm thinking of somebody at home in quarantine right, or, 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 or still distancing right now that, 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 that we all know and love. And, and, and they can eat me under the table and they look like they did when I met them nine years ago. And I just have a hard time with it. I could do this all day. You know those people who just have a metabolism. And whatever you throw in the furnace, they just burn it. It's absolutely gone. It doesn't matter. I I told a guy like that one time, I said, if something ever happens to you, I want you to fill out a donor card and tell them that you are giving, you're leaving your thyroid gland to me. Because I need your, you know, my mother had to have thyroid surgery. My grandmother had thyroid surgery. And every three months when I go to see my endocrinologist, he, he always checks my throat. I said, tell me you found a thyroid problem. He said, no. I said, you need to. He said, you want one. I said, I want to be able to tell people that I don't look like this because I eat. I look like this because I have a thyroid problem. I know all kind of folks who diagnose themselves with thyroid trouble. I want that to be me. Right there under the voice box behind your collarbone, that little bow tie shaped gland, the thyroid. One of its primary purposes is to regulate the rate at which your body processes progress. The thyroid can drive an appetite forward when everything else says you should be perfectly satisfied. When you've eaten too much, you're not even working it off. 
If your thyroid kicks up, there you are ready to eat the box the food came in. And the table it was sitting on. The first thing I want to dwell on today. And I can't make another point to substitute for this one. If we want that kind of appetite in our spiritual lives. The beginning isn't some great thing. The beginning's a simple thing. I've got to ask for it. I've purposed in my heart that when I pray the first time every day, I ask God to inflame my spiritual appetite. See, if we're not careful, we'll be ruled by our feelings and they're fickle. If you go to work when you feel like it, you'll be unemployed by the end of the week because you'll never go again. Unless you're one of those strange people, if you only, if you only uh, mow your yard when you feel like it, you'll live in a jungle by August. If I only washed my truck when I felt like it, it would have never been washed. Because never has a day come that I woke up thinking, man, I can't wait to wash my truck. If I only fed the dog when I felt like it, we'd have fewer dogs. That might be the way to go. We're just waiting for God. You know, if God wanted me to pursue Him passionately, He would make me want to pursue Him passionately. And I don't feel like really going to church. And I don't feel like it. I don't feel. Of course, you don't feel like it. We are carnal human beings. I wake up every day and I say, God, I want you to ignite a hunger in me to climb into the depths of your word like I've never known before. I want you to enlarge my appetite. I want you to deal with me. Help me to desire spiritual things like never before. Thank you for the miracles we've seen. Thank you for the blessings we've received. Thank you God for what we've seen you do. But make us hungry to know you and to be like you. I'm not hungry for the miraculous but the miracle worker. I'm not hungry just for the book but I want to know the author. God do something inside of me. Well, there are specific things we can do. I remain convinced that anyone who wants a consuming spiritual hunger can start just by asking for it. James chapter 4 verse 2 says we have not because we ask not. It's amazing the things we scheme about and worry about that we never pray about. I don't really want to worship like I used to. Talk to him about that. I'm not really jazzed up to get to church. Talk to him about that. I don't really want to read my Bible. Talk to him about that. It starts with something that simple. Lord help me to log off to back out. Put an appetite in me. If I don't want to do it, I'm telling you that I want to want to do it. You ask for it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. It's so simple. The Bible says ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. It's hard to find things you're not looking for. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now here's strong language. Everyone. Not most people. Not 74%. Not all of the spiritual giants. Everyone that asketh receiveth. That means if I'm not receiving. And he that seeketh findeth. If I don't have it. I've got to ask myself if I'm really seeking it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Verse 9. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent? Last verse. If ye then being evil... Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him. Psalm 84 says it like this. This is a good thing. He wants each of us to have it. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is the sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Some might ask the question about whether this kind of appetite we're talking about is something that he'll just give or something we have to develop ourselves. The answer is yes. He'll give it to you and you have to develop that. There are things
things that we are called to do. But don't ever forget, you've got a thyroid gland in your body. And I'm convinced there's one in your spirit too. It sets the pace for your walk with God. It is a miraculous creation. That's why he said in Psalm 37, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Notice that. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's not some kind of heavenly gift card store that we walk into and pick the one off the shelf we want. It's not grandma's house where we just dig through till we find what we're looking for. If I delight myself in him, if I become delighted in him, if he is the center of my delight, then he can remake my desires. They'll be a lot more like his and he can give me the desires of my heart. The closer I get to him, the more my desires change. There are lots of things that are carnal. They're not sinful. They're just carnal. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not ungodly. Neither are they godly. They're just things. And we all have avenues of entertainment and distraction that we like. And I found that people who have one may not understand folks who have another, but we all have them. Can I be honest? The closer I get to the Lord... The more my appetite for things that are not carnal, that are not sinful, just just carnal. It's amazing to me how when I spend enough time with him, it's not that I don't enjoy those things. I, I just don't ride around thinking about them anymore. They're not in the epicenter of my mind. This is something we ask for. Oh, I've got to be careful here. We've got to understand what we're looking at. Does anyone know who uh, Louis Wyshansky was? Uh, he, he was uh, Dr. Christian Bernard's first uh, uh, heart transplant patient, the first pure heart transplant that took place in the world in Cape Town, South Africa in 1967. And uh, it was a modern medical miracle. It changed the world. It, it remade uh, uh, cardiovascular medicine and launch careers. There are people here alive today who are partially alive because of what was learned in the aftermath of that. But if we read the Word of God, we understand that God was doing heart transplants long before Dr. Bernard was ever born. In Deuteronomy 28, he gives a trembling heart. In 1 Kings chapter 3, he gives an understanding heart. In 1 Chronicles 29, he gives a perfect heart. In Jeremiah 24, he gives a heart to know the Lord. In Ezekiel 36, he gives a new heart. That's why David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because I understand I don't just have a heart that trembles at his word or his presence. He puts that there. I don't wake up with a clean heart. He puts that there. Nobody has a perfect heart on their own. He puts that there. A heart to know the Lord. If you don't feel that this morning, I hope before you leave you find a corner, find an altar, or right at your chair just close your eyes and say God I want to have a heart to know you I want that to be my desire if I don't feel that way I'm asking you to help me to feel that way we pray for God to increase our appetite for righteous and spiritual things the second thing we have to do is get a new taste in our mouth you ever known anybody, don't point, don't raise your hands, who went on the Atkins diet? My dad was neck deep in that at one time. and He said, oh, anytime you crave, crave sugar, just put cheese in your mouth. I'm not saying he's wrong. I can eat sharp cheddar and Snickers bars interchangeably. I like both of them. But he testifies of a truth. That cheese robbed him of the desire for sugar. I do understand that what we put in our mouth changes our taste buds. You ever laid your diet Dr. Pepper down and brushed your teeth and then tried to take another fresh swig of it with Colgate in your mouth? It does not taste the same. It does not. You ever taken a bite of something so grotesque that you lost your appetite? I mean, you were hungry a minute ago, but you're not hungry anymore. Thanksgiving dinner with grandma's burnt gravy. 
And after that, whatever you taste, tastes like burnt gravy. Threw a rotten peanut in my mouth one time. Everything at Texas Roadhouse was wasted after that. A bad taste can sour your experience. Now I wish I had time to preach about people who somehow think the entire kingdom sour, but you just encountered one bad peanut, and that's a whole nother message. Whole nother message. But the flip side is also true. A good taste can stir up an appetite in you. That has no other good reason to exist. You ever been on the second day of a fast and walked by the aroma of freshly baked bread? And all at once you could take your shoes off and eat every speck of them. You don't even have to be on a fast. You can be practically full when somebody pulls a fresh plate of chocolate chip cookies out of the oven. And the whole world stops. You're full but you want one. And you know if you eat one, you'll eat three more out of principle. You're like that little blue guy on Sesame Street. All you can think of cookies, you know. Why? Because a little taste of something can awaken and create an appetite inside of us. That's what happened to me. Psalm 34, 8. He said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I had no spiritual appetite. But the moment his presence began to move in me, all of my wants changed. All of my desires changed. And when I see him changing back, I know the problem is what I'm feeding myself. Because when there's a fresh taste when there's a fresh aroma the appetite takes care of itself if you're like me and your appetite for the things of God increases in that you understand I can encourage myself I can encourage my appetite by design I can do this on purpose if I start doing the right thing all of my taste buds will change what's got off of diet sodas for six months Took me a week to get my taste straightened back out where I wanted those nasty things, but I did. Because if you drink enough of it, you'll fix yourself. See, I've got a purpose to expose my heart, spirit, and life to Him by design. And if I do that by design, the rest of this stuff will take care of itself. I love the feeling. I love to be intoxicated with the presence of God, not down by it. I love it when you can just throw yourself in the middle of it and lose yourself there. But if you think that happens because of certain singers or certain preachers or certain conferences, you don't understand what's happening in you. It's your appetite. Camp meetings, camp meeting, because we go to church all day, every day, and we set our appetite on it. In AYC is in AYC because of our appetite. Youth camp Camps, youth camp because of our appetite and when we long for a former day we're really longing for a former appetite if you'll get it right here and if you'll get it right here you'll find out he's the same all the time and he's the same everywhere see in spiritual matters if you want your appetite to form you have to eat right regardless of your feelings We've talked about how you can ignore hunger pains and it takes days, but your body stops secreting hunger pains because it assumes you're in a position where you can't feed yourself and now you're wasting away and you're dying, but, but, but you're not even walking around with the munchies. Lamentations 4 and 9 said, For that reason, better are they that are slain by the sword than they that are slain by hunger. But conversely, if you start doing the right thing, If you start doing the right thing, those hunger pains kick right back up. This purpose is perhaps a real barrier for us. I want to ask us as a group, if you want to take that journey, you need to wake up and purpose in your mind, I'm going to pray every day, no matter what's happening, no matter what I feel like, I'm going to have a premeditated prayer. God, make me hungry. God, make me thirsty. If I'm not craving the right things, help me to do what I got to do to crave the right things just to find a way to do it I'm calling us to begin a a regular pattern of reading and studying and meditating on the word of God it's the only way to get interested in us The, the, the scripture tells us this and we've lived it long enough to know that our appetite changes when our diet changes there's nothing like just a touch of it I've seen people backslid and cold for years who'd use foul language if you tried to invite them to a church service but 
in the right moment when their head's right and their heart's right and they're restored by the grace into the kingdom of God. There's just an appetite that comes alive inside of them. It is that way for all of us. And there's nothing like a touch of Jesus to awaken a hunger in you. Now this doesn't work for church addicts or conference aholics. It's a personal relationship. It's something that doesn't just move through your ears. It has to go to the very depths of your heart and soul. Job's testimony. He said, I've esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. Or the psalmist who said, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I've got to hurry. I can assure you that Jesus above all things is highly addictive. And when you become intentional about pursuing him, he is very intentional about responding to you. And what used to be a discipline, what used to be a burden becomes a pleasure. When you have that living relationship with his word, when you have that living relationship in prayer, it changes your entire relationship with God. There is a spiritual inertia that exists. You know the law of inertia, something at rest tends to stay at rest and something in motion tends to stay in motion. The battle is to overcome my spiritual inertia and put myself in motion. Once I start moving in prayer, once I start moving in the word, once I start moving in worship, once I start moving toward God, once I start, everything else will take care of itself. It's like those potato chips in the tube. No one can eat just one. I knew a lady who claimed that she didn't enjoy reading. And then Francine Rivers came along. Some of you have no idea who I'm talking about. Others are rereading in your mind right now. I mean, I couldn't have given this person that book and begged them to read it. But once they fell into one, now they're at the bookstore the day the new one's supposed to be released and fussing if it's not out yet. Because something was awakened in them. That same effect is available in the spiritual world. I know, ladies, Francine Rivers is spiritual. We're not going there. That's another conversation. There's just something about it. Once it gets in your heart and your mind, the most powerful praise, the most powerful display of physical worship doesn't come as response to what God's doing. Anyone can thank God for what He's doing. Honey, the power is in premeditated praise. The power's in premeditated prayer. Everything's different when it's premeditated. So I want to issue a quick challenge to us. Start your day. Just try it for a week. Start your day with Jesus. Start your day with Him. The New Testament introduces an idea that one day your season is no longer holier than another. In the Old Testament, feast days were powerful and important. Uh, the Sabbath day was powerful and important. And I've known sweet people who tried to drag that into the New Testament with them. But Paul is exceedingly clear that we can't let any man judge you in new moons and Sabbaths, holy days, feast days. Those things are gone. They were a shadow of things to come. So what was a Sabbath day in the Old Testament is now a Sabbath experience. It is the Holy Ghost. This is the rest wherewith we enter in and he will give us rest in like fashion. No hour hour of the day is any more holy or less holy than another hour of the day. At my home church, my pastors prayed from 4.45 till, you know, I think about 6.30 every day of his life since he was a teenager. And so it became fashionable. The men began to meet him at 5 a.m. to pray. A lot of men would roll out of bed at my home church and they'd all pray with Brother Smith at 5 a.m. I tried that for a few days. I had a furniture store. I worked till late at night. And, and I told him, I said, I know this is powerful, Brother Smith. He said, yeah. I said, the Lord spoke to me this morning. He said, what did he say? He told me to go to bed and talk to him at 8 so he could understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> he laughed at me. I said, Brother Smith, I'm not a morning person. I build sermons at night. My brain's sharper at night. I make decisions at night. He said, that's strange. I said, I'm strange. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to start praying at midnight every night. And I'll pray as long as you do. And you can know when you wake up that I've already outprayed you and there's no more pressure. It worked better for me. He still doesn't understand it. But it worked better for me. Now I know that some people are roosters and other people are owls. 
Some people are sloths. That's another message. <laughs> but he is on to something. Because there is something about starting your day with spiritual things. I read a verse recently, Psalm 63 and 1. Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Early. I'm not saying you got to get up at 4 a.m. Some of you do anyway. I'm not saying you got to get up at 3 or 5 or 6. But whenever up is for you, if you want to change and develop an appetite, Start your day by talking to him. He opened something up to me once and it's changed my life. The pattern you start your day with defines typically the rest of your day. Or at least how you see it and pursue it. Oh, I've got to be careful here. If you wake up grumbling, you're probably going to be in a bad mood all day. My mom wakes up singing and she sings all day. If you wake up and make yourself smile and find something to thank God for, a thankful day becomes a lot easier. I'd like for my first thought every morning to be about Him and then coffee. Isaiah 26, 9, I got to hurry. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me, I will seek thee early. See, some people wake up and say, good morning, Lord. And others wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. Don't point at your spouse. I'm going to challenge us. to. This is Wednesday night stuff. I know it's not Sunday preaching, but, but, but for those of you who've never been on a Wednesday night, this is the difference. Um, I'm just going to let that marinate for a minute. If, not even going to fix it. If you want to change your day, give Jesus the first bit and not the leftovers. If you deal with him first, you know, you walk out of a meeting like I do and you got 19 text messages and you flip through to see where the fire is and you respond to that one first. You flip through and see who's in trouble and you respond to that one first. You don't ever want to be the first one I call back. That's bad news for you. If you start your moment with Jesus, him first. If you routinely flip on the news, tomorrow just make a decision. I'm going to get up five minutes early or I'm not going to turn it on first. I'm going to listen to some good news instead. I'm going to give that time. I'm going to read the Word of God. If you're too lazy to read, there's a Bible app that will talk to you now right on your phone. Just find what works for you. If you start your day on an iPad logging into Breitbart or Fox News or any of those others, just give that time to God first. If you usually get up at 6.30, let's take baby steps. Get up at 6.25 and give Him five minutes just thanking Him for everything, not asking Him for anything. There's something else about this that will change you. Psalm chapter 5 verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee and we'll look up because if I look up first it changes everything that happens after that he said I will sing of thy power yea I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble he went on to say it again cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning God if I know you love me in the morning for in thee do I trust Because to me to know wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. It changes when I start early. Our landing gear's down. I want to reiterate. I'm not saying the morning hours is is, is when you do it. You wouldn't want to hear a sermon I put together early in the morning. Sometimes the Lord will give me something and I'll wake up and scratch it down and go back to bed. But I make my life decisions. We were evangelizing one toddler and then two in a travel trailer. I changed my whole approach because late at night I'm wound up from service and everybody else is asleep and that's when it worked for me. I'm not asking you to change your nature. And neither is the Word of God. 
Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He's saying, God, I want you to know that you're going to hear from me early on my lunch break, at night. You're, I want you to know that I am coming to see you. What I am telling you is your metabolism changes by what you eat in the beginning. I had a dietitian tell me one time that your metabolism doesn't really wake up until you put something in your mouth. It doesn't have to be much. She said, if you're not a breakfast person, eat a cracker when you wake up. But your metabolism does not come online until you start eating your first bite. That's why your mother used to tell you that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It gets your metabolism started. It gets your system moving. It, it actually helps you burn more calories throughout the day if you do it correctly. And a proper breakfast will produce, they say, a proper appetite. I'm not a dietitian. I don't know about them. But I do know this. When I start my day with a little time for Jesus, everything that happens after that is uniquely and completely different. Let, let's stand together. The reason some people don't think about him till church starts is they hadn't thought about him all day long. I want you to ask yourself a question. Did you get up today thinking about coming to church? Who you're going to see at church? Who you're going to hang out with after church? Can't wait to see brother him and sister her and that fat baby. and Oh, brother Moore, just can't wait to hear him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you think about Jesus at all? Now don't get me wrong. If you're in the church all the time, he has everything to do with that. But God help and forgive me. Or we'll find ourselves picking out songs to get service moving. And designing worship services to motivate people. And if we're not careful, we can get together three times a week. And sing about him with each other and talk about him with each other. But only a little bit of that time is he even the real focus if we're not careful. Now that's not our disease here, but Lord help us, I don't ever want it to be. And if you're here today because of friendship and people who've loved you, I thank God for that. But we want you to fall in love with Jesus because you're going to need him when we're in the grave. On people who live for God, life relocated them and they never could. They struggled after that because this church isn't like the church I came to the Lord in. If you're a church junkie, you're doomed. Churches change. This church has changed. Good, bad, or ugly, give it nine more years, it'll change again. You've changed. We all do. We're human beings, but he doesn't change at all. And when you make it about him, it recolors and reflavors everything else. If you start your day with him, Sunday's not the last day of the week. It's the first because that New Testament church in the book of Acts, they started their week with Jesus. If you start your day with him, it'll recolor your entire appetite. Start tomorrow. Maybe you're a shower singer. Change the song and sing about him. If you can't sing at all like me, just thank him for your blessings. Pray for your family. Read your breakfast, but read a psalm with it. Before you go to work, read a chapter of Proverbs. It's the most important meal of the day because it's the first one. So, closing, if you want to work up a righteous spiritual appetite, ask Him to give it to you. Lord, I'm not even interested at all. Be that honest with Him. Say, I don't know what's wrong with me because I want to be interested. Can I be real? People I've known and loved in my life, the same ones who are always, well, I know, but I mean, is this really a sin? They're also the ones that say, I mean, does the Bible say we have to go to church more than once a week? Does it even say we have to go once? And the same ones who say, I mean, I know this isn't, but I mean, you know, let's talk about what you watch. Is this really that bad? I listen to this, but I mean, you know, is it really that bad? If you start looking at their life, can I be honest? 
All of their appetites are taking them in one direction. What do you do? Don't judge them. Love them. Pray for them. But then look in the mirror and say, God, oh God, if I'm not hungry for you, make me hungry. If I'm not thirsty, make me thirsty. If I'm afraid to get into the Word because of what it says about my situation, put a desire in me. I want to be thirsty. One. Two. Premeditated. Jesus in your life. Premeditated prayer. Premeditated praise. I lost 40 pounds in five weeks once and it had nothing to do with how I felt. It was decisions that I made. Need to make them again. Now you mind your own business. And three, start your day with it. There's barely two weeks. I don't know if there is two. I don't even know what day it is. Try the rest of this month. Start with it. Every day for the rest of this month. And see if your life changes. What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? Oh, let's close our eyes and ask Him right now, God. I'm asking you to touch us. Help us, Lord, to crave, to desire. I'm asking you, God, to make us a people that pray about our appetite. Lord, make us a people that purpose in our heart to pursue you. Help me, God, to not just carve out time, but the perfect time, the significant time. Lord, I want you to deal with me. I want you to deal with me. We want you to deal with us. Help us to take the liberty and steps in your direction God that you can rekindle an appetite in me that you can change the way I think, the way I feel what I want, let it be alive in us today Jesus in your name in your name, in your name can we just take a few moments and talk to him where you are, or you can come to the altar whatever you're comfortable with today can we talk to him about our appetite If you're not really interested in prayer time anymore, can you talk to him about that? If your pulse doesn't beat faster when he's the subject, can you talk to him about that? Create it in me, Jesus. Create it in me, Jesus.
Just before. 